Welcome to the fourth segment in our session on inflammatory myopathies. In the last two segments, we covered the first two major classes of inflammatory myopathy, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, which shared a number of similarities with one another. The final class we are going to discuss is inclusion body myositis, and as we will see, it has a distinct presentation pattern when compared to the previous two conditions. As with the previous two segments, we will look at the pathophysiology, presentation pattern, treatment, and prognosis for inclusion body myositis, which will help us develop an ability to make a differential diagnosis for the three types of inflammatory myopathy. The epidemiology for inclusion body myositis is distinct from what we observed with dermatomyositis and polymyositis. The two previous conditions were more prevalent in women and in black populations. For inclusion body myositis, the reverse is true, with higher incidence in males and lower incidence in black populations. The total prevalence is 4.9 per 1 million, with this rate being twice as high in an older population. Inclusion body myositis is also unique in that it can be unilateral and affect distal limb musculature. Although inclusion body myositis has an inflammatory component and is included in the inflammatory myopathy classification, the pathophysiology of the disease is still unclear and unlike that seen for the other two conditions. The disorder is characterized by the presence of vacuoles and filamentous inclusions within the muscle cells. A few theories have been proposed to explain the pathophysiology behind the disease. One involves an autoimmune cytotoxic T-cell mediated attack similar to that seen in polymyositis. A second theory is that the disease involves a primary degenerative process related to abnormal protein processing. In this theory, the degenerative changes are what trigger the inflammatory response in the muscle. A third theory is that the inflammation response is the result of an as of yet unidentified trigger. The initial presentation involves the onset of muscle weakness with no apparent cause. The presentation may be unilateral or bilateral. Unlike the other forms of inflammatory myopathy, it does not follow a limb girdle distribution pattern. Wrist flexors, knee extensors, and ankle dorsiflexors are also commonly affected. In fact, this pattern of weakness in wrist flexors combined with knee extensors is so unique that it puts inclusion body myositis at the top of the differential diagnosis list. Patients will first present with unexplained muscle weakness, which will precipitate an order for blood work. There may be slight increases in creatine kinase levels, but not to the same degree as other myopathies we have studied to this point. A number of other tests including electromyography, may be ordered with inconclusive findings, which should ultimately lead to an order for muscle biopsy. The precise location of the biopsy is difficult to determine due to the asymmetry and variability of the weakness patterns that are observed. An MRI may assist in identifying the appropriate muscles to biopsy. Tissue analysis will demonstrate vacuoles and aggregates of proteins within the muscle fibers which can confirm the diagnosis of inclusion body myositis. Analysis of these protein aggregates reveal nucleoporin in about 44% of identified cases and rimmed vacuoles in combination with P62 aggregates in 93% of cases. Electron microscopy analysis may also demonstrate the presence of tubulofilament aggregates and abnormal mitochondria. Tissue samples will also demonstrate variable amounts of inflammation surrounding individual fibers, primarily composed of T-cells and macrophages. There is also a collection of small atrophic muscle fibers within the sample. Treatment options are limited for inclusion body myositis. Unlike other inflammatory myopathies, inclusion body myositis is not responsive to corticosteroids. This supports the theory that inflammation is secondary to the disease process, otherwise controlling the inflammation should alleviate some of the symptoms. This means that little can be done to alleviate the natural progression of the disease. Fortunately, although progressive, the condition itself is not fatal. The patient should be referred to occupational therapy who can work with the individual to develop orthotic devices and make accommodations to the living environment 
which would allow patients to better manage the condition. That concludes this segment on inclusion body myositis. In the final segment for this session, we'll take a moment to summarize our understanding of inflammatory myopathies and develop a model for coming to a differential diagnosis.